Hey, lovely people of the internet. This is the third time I've tried to record this. I'm just not good with the audio. <laughs> anyway, the third time around means it's going to be even better. So, um, if you don't, uh, if you haven't already seen my cinematography breakdowns, go and check out my blog, matscottvisuals.com, um, and just do a quick search for the word breakdown. And I did one a couple of years ago, three years ago, on the movie Prisoners um, in great detail, and I sort of just go through the whole film and just talk about things that caught my eye or um, it's, it's basically just me over-analyzing things. I over-analyze coffee, I over-analyze food and people and myself and, and also over-analyze cinematography. <laughs> um, and, but it can be a good thing because it can really teach you um, just to be observant and to look at the finer details of such an amazing craft. Um, especially if you analyze the work of a master like Roger Deakins and, and the crew that works with him. Um, a lot of things come into play like what lens choices use, the blocking of the scene, the you know, you know what I'm talking about. The cinematic look isn't just the camera. It's the lighting. It's, it's the music. It's the script. It's the color choice. It's all of these things. But we, we know all that. Um, but what's annoying about the internet is even though everyone knows what makes a film look the film look, they're still like sort of searching for it or searching for like this thing that does it. But the problem is there is no thing that makes the film look. We already know that. So I'm rambling already. Go and check out my original breakdowns, um, which are pretty inaccurate, but they could be interesting. <laughs> um, I did another one on Inglorious Bastards as well. But um, today, I'm going to be talking about um, a breakdown of a commercial. And uh, this particular commercial really grabbed my attention. I really, really like it. And there's a lot of interesting things about it. Um, you may also notice I've got uh, Matt Workman's podcasts up here. Just pimping myself. <laughs> And um, the reason I bring up Matt Workman is because he also has done a lot of amazing cinematography breakdowns. I'm um, just talking about lighting and, and equipment that's used and sort of speculates how things may have been shot or what things were paid attention to. But I just want to make it clear that I made that shit famous. <laughs> so, um, and Matt also interviewed me um, some time ago on his podcast, which is kind of embarrassing. But anyway, go and check that out. And he's got a lot of great content. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Good first name as well. Anyway, so back to this commercial. Um, it's a commercial for Subaru Australia and um, there, it's evident that a lot of money, time and effort was put into this commercial. Um, but I'm going to go through some of the finer things that I've noticed about the commercial that I think really make it work. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I think I picked this commercial is because I feel like it, it, aligns, it aligns itself with my taste. I really like deliberate camera moves. I like a still camera often actually, which is um, odd these days because every camera has to move. <laughs> Although I am um, becoming quite a fan of handheld and easy rig stuff, thanks to Mark Kullenberg who's amazing at it. Um, but yeah, just thinking about how a camera is used, moved, framed, um, and more importantly than that, how do you tell a story in one minute? Um, this is a really good example, so go ahead and check out this um, commercial, it's really, really good. So anyway, let's just jump right into it. I've ripped the, um, have I? I've just recorded it using Camtasia screen recorder. Am I still recording? Phew. Like I said, this is the third time audio. Yes, still recording. Um, but I've just recorded this and then I've brought it into Resolve. And um, I've done that for a few reasons. One, so we can just sort of um, make it full screen and I can just start and stop it whenever I like. But also, um, this allows us to have a look at the color palette on a vector scope. Um, it also allows us to have a look at how many shots it, they decided to shoot to cover a one minute film, so a total of 24 shots. And I wonder if they shot a shitload more than that. I wonder, there's so many I wonders. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and speculate a whole bunch of shit that probably isn't true, um, but in any case, it's still really, really interesting. The first thing I want to start with is the color palette. This is the most exciting thing for me about this commercial. It's the thing that stood out instantly to me. Uh, for this commercial because I'm always looking for these things. Um, so we've all heard of the teal orange look and how you know often people are upset that it's overdone uh, but it's done for a reason. The teal orange look is a successful color palette. One because orange is the color of skin and orangey, reddy, yellow sort of that's the direction of skin. So what's the opposite opposing complementary colors to yellow and red? It's blue and cyan and that's why it works. Why don't we use magenta and green? Um, you know, no one's talking about the magenta -y green film that looked awesome. Um, and that's probably because skin doesn't lie within those values. Um, so maybe in a sci-fi film, 
or in a weird color graded commercial that could work or a music video. But the point is, um, that's my theory about why teal and orange actually works so well. Uh, one, because it's a complementary color system and two, because part of those complementary colors are skin. So with that said, this commercial has the most amazingly consistent color palette. It's ridiculous. Um, and I'm talking about the choice of the color of that fence and the roof and the color of her top and the color of her car, of this car. So you can see in this frame alone, um, let's ignore the um, muted greens for a second and the color of the road. All, basically every single shot in this film is meticulously colored in terms of the design of the shot. What color clothes are they wearing? What color is that ball? Look at the color of these flowers. These hydrangeas are even the, basically the same complementary colors that we see throughout the entire film. We get to the end here. Uh, let me just start at the start. Okay, so we've got blue and red flowers, blue and red clothes, blue car, red ball, blue top on the kid, red taillights, blue car, blue and red packing stuff for the camping trip, blue bike. We look in the background, blue sign, blue Subaru, the clothes that dad's wearing, blue. It's just ridiculous. It's so well looked after. Next shot, same thing. And sure, you might say, oh, but what about the pink? Well, pink, red, magenta, orange, you know, you can tell that they're all part of the same rough palette. And that's the whole point here. But these are the complementary colors that lie within the shot. Even this blue lens flare. <laughs> um, obviously, the color, color grading has something to do with this. And those colors can be emphasized with a grade. But it was thought about well before the color grade. This color palette was designed. The color of his top really helps break up this scene, the lighter blue. Imagine he had a dark blue top or a white top. It just wouldn't have that same balance. Um, and the beauty of this sort of color blue against skin is it just looks, it makes skin look even nicer. Let's have a look at the next shot. Same color palette, although not as many reds, we still have that yellow, orange and blue. And that's literally the only real dominant complementary colors in the scene. As we keep going, you can see the same things happening here. Blue lens flare. <laughs> here we go again. Same complementary colors throughout. Red lights, blue sky, red sign, blue sky. It just continues. And this is where I thought how ridiculous it is and how much money Subaru must be throwing at a commercial like this. Even the color of the train carriages, red, blue, alternating. <laughs> Did they pay for that? Did they design that or was it just a fluke? In any case, it's ridiculous. This whole commercial, we're only talking about color at this stage. There's a whole lot of other amazing things about it. Um, this just, this just took my breath away. <laughs> it didn't really, but it did make me think. Anyway, so here we are continuing on. The color grade's helping here, but we do have a blue in the shadows and our red slash yellow slash orange in the skin. Continuing on, same thing. And you get the point, right? A consistent color palette is really important. And it's, dare I say, more important than a color grade. Um, often, as I'm also a colorist, I'll get sent films or commercials and the brief of the commercial is, oh, can you make this teal orange? Or can you sort of give it a cinematic look? And, you know, they might have a similar shot to this, but she's wearing a bright green t-shirt. The little kid's wearing a white t-shirt. Dad's wearing um, a Hawaiian shirt. Um, half of these things are multicolored. So like all of a sudden, the balance of the colors in the frame before I even grade them are wrong. They're distracting. Um, they're not balanced. And this makes color grading very difficult. So lighting is a huge um, component of color grading and getting the, the look but also, um, as you can see here, so is production design. And dare I say, these um, hydrangeas were put there. <laughs> um, we can talk about a whole bunch of other things in a second. I just wanted to finish up with that. Yes, okay. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was the edit. Um, I think this is a really, really imp um, impressive piece when it comes to editing and blocking and basically um, film language, when you're talking about the movement of the camera, the movement of people and the flow of the edit. Um, let me sort of elaborate on that a little bit. So here you can see camera is moving left to right. 
and actually I might just point out, I'm pretty sure this tree was added in post. <laughs> just to imagine that tree wasn't there, which I don't think it is. Um, it's just adding an extra layer of depth. Um, that's a whole other topic. But anyway, I just thought that was interesting. Um, if you shot this commercial or had anything to do with it, please contact me, comment on this, and um, tell me I'm wrong, tell me I'm an idiot, or tell me I'm right and, and sort of help, help the community um, appreciate this magnificent piece. So anyway, film language, we're talking about... Um, okay, so let's have a look at the overall story. The overall story goes for one minute, and it's about a happy family. Mum's at home, two kids, one kid very young, Dad is going on a weekend, maybe, or a day trip with the son to spend some father-son time. Very important stuff. This is a classic, beautiful Subaru family. But there's drama at home, because Dad and son don't spend enough time. He works too much. Mum's getting pissed off. So anyway, they go on an adventure. Yay. Okay, so they're out on the road, driving along, and Dad's like, hmm, how are we going to make this memorable and enjoyable? How am I going to connect with my son? Traveling along, traveling along, everything seems to be fine. Crossroads. Hold on a second. What if we get out of the car and enjoy this moment together? I know my son loves trains. I do, Dad. That's it, I'm gonna do it. Gets out. Happy son. Happiest he's ever been, actually. <laughs> Thanks, Subaru. So anyway, we have this story to tell. We have one minute to tell it. And um, getting back to my film design language camera movement blocking discussion <laughs> is, check this out, this is really, really fascinating to watch the arc of the story, uh, which I sort of just made up just then. The arc of the story um, script wise, but then have a look at the arc of the story in terms of how the camera moves, how it stops moving, and the direction and the flow of how people move within those frames. So camera moves left to right. We're on an adventure. Why, I mean, why are we moving left to right? Maybe because when we write, we're writing left to right. Maybe that's just a natural way that the brain looks at progression. So we're progressing left to right. Boy runs to the right. Car drives off to the right. Even mum walks off to the right. We could have just had her stand there. But no, she walks off to the right as well. It helps flow. Now we're driving father looking to the right, looking into the direction they're driving. Car driving to the right. Sun looking to the right. Lens flare to the right. <laughs> car still driving to the right. Wide shot, car driving to the right. Camera tracking to the right. But hold on a second. Whoa. Nothing is to the right now, except maybe this red light. It's stopping our progress. We have a centered frame. And not only that, as our eye travels and focuses on this car, look where our, our, our eye is looking. Our eye is looking here, eye looking here. Boom. Our eye is looking here and we see the word stop. The progress has stopped. The drama is about to ensue. So now we have this centered frame. We have red flashing lights. And notice, red flashing light on the left, on the right. Now our attention is focused on the right-hand side of the frame. And what happens in the edit? We're looking at the right-hand side of the frame. We're looking at dad. Voiceover's talking about time. Thumb tapping the steering wheel, helping emphasize that voiceover. And check this out. This is where it gets really cool. So we're traveling along, left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right. We hit a crossroads, boom, center frame. What happens now? train, the thing that actually caused the drama, is moving to the opposite side. The whole film has turned. <laughs> now we're traveling to the left, traveling to the left. Frame to the left. We're looking at the left. He's even pointing to the left. Camera pans up. Dad's looking to the left. Dad turns around to his son, to the left. Train still traveling to the left. This is just awesome. Son focused on the left, dad focused on the left. Isn't this amazing? Did they think of this? And check it out. Once dad realizes that, you know what? Maybe this crossroad isn't such a bad thing. Maybe this is an opportunity for me and my son to connect. And when he makes that decision, cinema language changes, center frame. Now we're balanced again. We have a sense of like, you know what? This is a good thing. 
and we have the hero shot of the car. The camera is traveling to the left, revealing the car. We want to make sure that, you know, Subaru is responsible for this resolution. Subaru is the reason dad and son are now happy. <laughs> Again, left. Hero shot of the car. I think this is really fascinating. And then to finish on this hero shot, we've got to have a drone shot these days, but it's perfectly centered. They could have framed this any which way they wanted. A beautifully centered crossroad. We're moving forward, family's happy. Balanced frame, very interesting. So was all of this stuff, you know, was it all thought of in pre-production? I think we should give credit to the crew who made this. I'm gonna say yes, I think all of this stuff was considered and again, if you, if you had anything to do with this film, make sure you let me know. I'd love to find out if I'm right. Um, not because I want to be right. I do like being right. But more so just because it would be refreshing to know that that amount of effort and thought and care has gone into something, um, you know, beyond the set design, beyond the lens choice and the beautiful lighting and cinematography. But was the film language actually something that was, you know, considered? So some other things that I'd like to talk about that I think are interesting about this commercial um, is the editing again. So we need to condense quite a lot into one minute. And when you do that, you can afford to not show things. And, and this is a really important thing that I've been um, thinking about a lot. And it, a, a guy that sort of inspired me to think this way is Ryan Thomas. He's a writer director of some short films that I've shot a few years ago and a good friend of mine. Uh, if you find him on Instagram, I don't think he is. Anyway, Ryan Thomas, legend. He, um, he does think about this stuff a lot. And um, often when I'd be shooting with him, he'd often be talking about what not to include, what not to shoot. How can we shoot less and tell more? And this ad is also a really good example of that. So for example, kid runs to the car, dad's packing the car. He has a pile of shit there that he needs to pack into the car. There's like an hour of packing um, <laughs> to go there. Um, next shot. Everything's packed and they're driving away. So it's really a, a great use of that, um, the, the condensing of a storyline. But was it jarring? Did I feel like I missed out on anything? Not at all. We, we've got a setting and our, our brain's filling in the gaps for us. We don't need a dissolve there. We don't need to show him packing the car. We just, we're off on an adventure, that's it. Do we need to see them driving out of the suburbs? No. They're on the highway now. This is half an hour later. Although that was shot on the bridge, it looks like. But why not use that beautiful location? So there's a little bit of continuity here. We're still on the bridge. Didn't even see, you know, trains, a train line approaching. Um, you know, we might have been tempted if we were shooting this to have a shot on the dash looking ahead along the road and seeing a train approaching. But the beauty of this is it was it's quite a shock almost. Like remember I was like, boom, stop. What an effective use of cinema. Um, and if you have a look at this frame even, so we have the obvious hero shot of the car. Um, but then we have this quite odd framing. Um, and I thought this was odd, but then I sort of maybe realized why it was done. And I call this odd because I, I guess I would never frame a shot like this, a wide shot like this. One, because this is a car commercial, right? I can barely even see the car. Not only that, the car's in the right hand, bottom, bottom, lower, lower third of the frame. And as it travels, you can see less and less and less of it, right? That's an interesting composition. I mean, I would have had the horizon probably up here and it would have a car quite a bit larger and maybe creating some depth and having it leave the frame. But this works beautifully. I think this is a really effective storytelling technique because what it does is it forces you to look at the car and sort of follow the car because you're sort of like, oh, where's it going? It's disappearing. I want to see where it's going. It's disappearing. Oh. And it makes you focus down on this part of the frame, right? And then that's when, boom, we're presented with this crossroads. And it's also a surprise that we never even got to see the fact that there could be a train line ahead. All of a sudden, there just is. Really clever editing. Um, speaking of editing again and trying to make making things seamless. Uh, I talked about how on this previous shot, our eye is attracted to this red light. So we're already looking at this part of the frame. And what's the next shot? 
this part of the frame and where our eyes already looking at dad's eyes. Imagine dad's eyes were over here um, and previously we were attracted to this part of the frame and now we have to search for dad's eyes over here. It just wouldn't work. Of course it would work, but this is the thing that separates the big boys. These are the things that people think about and professionals, that's not the right word, creative, attentive and articulate masters of this craft. They're constantly thinking about these things. And this is where an editor can be um, an absolute godsend. But these things need to be thought about on the day in pre-production as well. Where are your eyes already looking? And what happens in the next frame? Really important. We could have framed that over here again. Here's another good example. So train traveling to the left. And what happens in the next frame? Camera travels, uh, sorry, hand travels to the left. So even movement can help. Another great example of a perfect cut. We're looking, we're paying attention to dad's eye. What's the next frame? We're literally a couple of pixels away from dad's eye. It's just perfect. This is why editing can look just so seamless and how editing can be seamless. And that's the whole point. You don't want people to notice and edit. And where it doesn't work is where you want someone to be looking across at someone. You don't want to have the sun here because then it would feel like a jump cut, or it would be a jump cut, plus you're crossing the line is what I meant to say. But when you're using eye lines, that rule can change and it actually makes sense to have the sun on the left hand side of the frame there because then you feel like, ah, he's looking at someone. He's looking across at someone. I really love the use of the reflection on the window there as well. It really helps that cut. Again, this is another really good example of condensing time. So here we have father and son sitting in the car, train passing, and dad's had this great idea. He's like, you know what? We're gonna get out of the car and enjoy this moment. But we didn't see that. We don't see the doors opening. We don't see the son getting out of the car. We don't see them undoing their seat belts. We're just, bang, we're here, we're done. We've got this beautiful central shot pushing in with a dolly slowly, and we've condensed time massively. But it works, it's still seamless. Um, another thing that I sort of noticed that might be interesting and I could be wrong, but if you have a look at the sign here, so we have a nice frame of sun snuggling into dad and um, you know, imagine this frame wasn't here. It might look like a bit of a, maybe a boring shot. Maybe they just wanted to add this into the frame, right? But if you have a look at the shot before it, oh, sorry, the shot after it, you'll notice that it's actually facing the other way. So, you know, if we did have the camera over here looking at sun snuggling into dad, what would you have in the background? You wouldn't have this sign. You would have the back of that sign and the back of these things. So my guess is that they've actually cheated that shot. And they've just placed these guys over here in front of that sign. Any case, it works fine. <laughs> and this is where continuity doesn't necessarily, you know, once you've taken things like edit lines, camera movement, eye lines, and all of the things I've been talking about into consideration. You can get away with inconsistencies like that. And another inconsistency is the lighting. So here there's no hard light whatsoever, no backlight whatsoever. Here we have hard backlight, hard backlight, and here we have again, hard backlight. It looks beautiful, but it doesn't necessarily match. Is it a big deal? No. A lot of the other important things about filmmaking and storytelling with these visual mediums have already been taken care of. And this is where we can sort of, we don't have to worry too much about that. Lighting consistency, for example. Um, I thought this was really clever too. So we have the train traveling left. And remember, it's Subaru that we thank for <laughs> um, this family resolution. And um, if you look at the camera movement, camera movement is traveling left, pointing towards the car, but also the train is helping us focus our attention. So our attention was on the father and son. Our attention is still on the father and the son. But now the camera dollies to the left, train is panning to the left. And what does that reveal? The car, ah, now our focus is on the car, that's right. The car is what did all this. 
And then to top that mastery off, we have this beautiful sun flare that creeps into the frame. So watch this left-hand side of the frame. Sun flare creeps in and basically reveals this tagline. Was that thought of on the day? Probably not. Flare in, tagline rolls. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> so many things about this ad are just masterfully executed. Really, really well done. Um, one last thing that I wanted to talk about. Actually, no. Did I mention, talking about the back to the very start about the consistent color palette, you can actually see it down here on the vector scope. Just scrubbing through these frames, you can see the colors without even looking at the film. They literally just lie within yellow and red and blue and cyan. Check it out. Isn't that cool? I love this shit. <laughs> um, yeah, one more thing I wanted to talk about was the use of um, what I think are anamorphic. So to me, this looks like anamorphic. And I'm not just saying that because of the 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. I'm saying that because anamorphic's not just about oval bokeh and um, anamorphic lens flares and, and distorted corners. And in fact, today's modern anamorphic lenses, um, often there's a few sets um, available now that are quite affordable, made by Atlas, uh, for example, have virtually zero distortion or have similar distortion characteristics to spherical lenses. Um, so uh, what I'm getting at, though, is that you'll notice this film, they're not sort of using anamorphics for cheap effect, if you know what I mean. There's no oval bokeh everywhere or um, anamorphic lens flares just spiking every shot. But what anamorphic does is it allows you to have a wide frame using a longer lens. And that's basically um, the whole thing that excites me about anamorphic. Um, for example, we could go in this car here. If I was to shoot this on the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K, um, I would have to shoot that with a 16 millimeter lens. If the, seat, if the camera was in the back seat, that's literally a 16 millimeter lens. And you know, my fastest 16 mil lens is 2. Point, uh, T2.2. And there's no way I'm going to get that sort of shallow depth of field. There's no way I'm going to get this lack of distortion and this beautiful compression that comes from an anamorphic. Uh, my guess is this was shot with a 40 millimeter anamorphic or even a 32 millimeter anamorphic, possibly even a 50 millimeter anamorphic. Because con consider this, you know, the characteristics of a 50 millimeter lens at say T2 or T2.8. That's kind of what this um, out of focus looks like to me. And this, it's, it's what sort of compression looks like to me. This looks like a 50 millimeter lens, but how is that possible? Well, it's possible because anamorphic allows you to have, imagine two 50 millimeter lenses stuck next to each other. It's the width of two 50 millimeter lenses with the characteristics of one 50 millimeter lens. Um, so you could basically say it's as wide as a 24 with the characteristics of a 50. And that's what's so exciting about anamorphic. And that's, this ad really makes use of that. Um, so not only are they using anamorphic, probably just for like the beautiful aesthetics of anamorphic, but they're using it practically. I mean, this shot as well. To shoot this on the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K, um, this would have to be done on a 24. But this does not look like a 24 to me. This looks like a 50. This looks like an 85 almost at f5, 6 or something like that. So if this was an anamorphic, that means it could be shot on a 45 millimeter lens. I'm sorry about that beeping in the background. It's frustrating me. Anyway, I'm rambling now, but um, thank you for watching. <laughs> and I'm sorry this is nowhere near as detailed as my um, usual blog post with all the, the lines and the logos and the, um, stuff like that. But I guess I've covered the same sort of things. And I just really wanted to show you this ad and hopefully and later appreciate what comes into or goes into a really effective one minute film, whether it be a short film or a commercial to sell cars. Um, there's just so much that goes into it and so much that we should be thinking about as cinematographers, as colorists, as production designers, as writers, as editors. Uh, if, if we can all sort of appreciate the craft and learn more about the craft just by studying it, um, I think we'll just have a better industry and a better, I don't know, Better, better, better. <laughs> anyway, guys, have a great week. I love you all. Bye.